colleagues and honored guests, the 2023 MHCID commencement ceremony for the University of California, Irvine has assembled. Please rise for the national anthem performed by Gray Patterson from MHCID's fourth cohort. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the I get seated. <laughs> no, 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 you sit now. Good afternoon. On behalf of the faculty of the University of California, Irvine, welcome to the 2023 graduate ceremony for the Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design candidates. Joining me today on the platform, but also in the audience, are distinguished faculty and other participants. Uh, Will the faculty and other participants please, please stand? Thank you. <laughs> you may be all be seated. Uh, this, uh, so this is the seventh time we're doing this commencement. The class of 2023 is our seventh cohort of the MHCID program with 46 students Set to rec uh, setting a record for the most well-attended MHCID graduate graduation yet. Uh, we have an overflow crowd. We have more than 350 uh, attendees. Uh, most of you are in this room, but we have an overflow room just uh, across the hall. Uh, so this is fantastic. Over the last year, the students have accomplished a lot, uh, both professionally and personally. I'll give you some of the professional personal highlights mostly, uh, and this is information we learned from them, okay? Uh, a number of students started new jobs, uh, moved, some of them across the country, uh, a few of them bought new houses. Gets more exciting. Uh, wait, wait. One student got married, while another became pregnant earlier this year. Someone, just to show you all the kinds of things you can do in an online program, in addition to becoming a super expert in what, you know, we're learning, we're teaching you. Someone completed their first half marathon. Another learned to kayak. Uh, one of the students designed a website for a medical organization set to go live at the end of the year. It's fantastic. Someone finished their second master's degree. Congratulations. A student was awarded two Addis, silver and bronze. One wasn't enough. That, that student had to do both. Uh, from the American Advertising Federation for uh, app design and creative technology. And one of the students, because of a family matter, 
uh, was stuck in Iran for almost eight months, but was proud to complete their courses despite all the censorship and internet connectivity issues. So while it was a demanding year, these students uh, were still able to bond with each other, and our faculty uh, allowed them to leave uh, UCI with not only a degree, but with some lifelong friends and mentors. Uh, again, I want to take this time to congratulate all of the graduating students for the hard-earned accomplishments. I also want to congratulate their parents, spouses, partners, children, significant others for their support during uh, this challenging year. It wasn't really a challenging year. I'm not sure. This, is, this has to be updated. The, <laughs> the year wasn't challenging. It was a fantastic year. And of course, I want to acknowledge our amazing faculty and staff. The staff are mostly sitting up there for their all. In the continued success of the MHCID program. Uh, I'll go off script here. Let's give a round of applause to everyone. Uh, faculty, staff, parents, students. This is the all-inclusive, all-encompassing uh, round of applause for the accomplishments and celebrations. Back to my script, for some reason, parenthesis, the font gets smaller by the year. I don't know what's <laughs> happening. Uh, Dr. Piper, please come forward to introduce uh, our first uh, student speaker. Thank you, Dean Marios. Each year, our students elect one of their peers to give a speech at graduation. Not only is this cohort unique in that it set a record for the number of attendees at graduation, it was also our first cohort to have a dead even tie for the selected or the elected student speaker. So today we're fortunate to hear from two of our accomplished MHCID students. It's my pleasure to introduce our first student speaker, John Nolan Moso. John is simply a joy to be around. He is curious, kind, and endlessly optimistic. Like all of you, he gave up a lot to be here today. He even rearranged his wedding plans so that he could attend our fall intensive and program kick up <laughs> and kick off. So thank you to his husband, Nero, for supporting him in this journey. Please join me in welcoming John Nolamoso to the stage. Oh. <laughs> This is actually far more anxiety driven than I thought it was going to be. So <laughs> uh, please, please bear with me. But um, all right, here we go. Um, I would like to thank everyone uh, for being here today as we embrace the transition from graduating to starting our next adventure. Uh, thank you to the faculty and staff who worked hard uh, to put this program together and the TAs for their hard work. Uh, I know Steve isn't here, but thanks to Steve and Anne Marie for being phenomenal representatives and helping us to get started and go through the journey. And thank you, Cohort 7, for the incredible year and honoring me with this opportunity to speak. Um, so I'm a nerd. So to quote the doctor, Doctor Who, um, everything ends, and it's always sad. Everything begins again, too, and that's always happy. Be happy. After reflecting on our time together through the program, one of the earliest themes that emerged and remained as a primary and foundational key to user experience work is the power of storytelling. Storytelling has been around since the earliest humans. Cavemen likely sat around a fire trying to share knowledge, news, fears, frustrations. Their early cave drawings would evolve into rich indigenous oral traditions, sharing stories to capture and retain knowledge, directions, and making sense of the world. As language and writing evolved, our stories were captured into scripture, scrolls, and books, making them smaller and easier to carry, share, and retain. Our stories became more important, educational, guiding, and more sophisticated. Fast forward to today, where we share knowledge, opinions, directions, and stories through digital means, like movies, YouTube, and TikTok. <laughs> the point being, human beings are natural storytellers and story listeners, they, and only the mediums have changed. While stories can be informative, persuasive, and entertaining, they can use to, be, to pass down history and culture from generation to generation, they have the power to move hearts and even nations. And a good story will stick with you like a good song. I personally referenced the song White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane on my application for this program. The line, remember what the Dormouse said, feed your head, no, I'm not singing that, 
saving you. Um, resonated with me as I had been feeling like an imposter since transitioning to user experience work and knew I had gaps in my knowledge base. So I applied and jumped down that rabbit hole with the goal of learning and challenging my perspectives. Where Alice had different food and drinks she could consume to change her size, we had classes and assignments design designed to challenge our perspectives and help us grow. Alice met many different characters on her journey and had to listen and empathize with those characters in order to move forward on her adventure. Our group projects and capstone gave us the opportunity to learn how to work with others and more importantly, how we can use empathy to champion the needs of the client and their respective end users. As part of her journey, Alice had to learn to radically accept the characters of the world that she was in. On an initial meeting with the Cheshire Cat, she had taken offense to the comment, we're all mad down here. I'm mad, you're mad. By the end of the journey, she was able to accept and understand the Cheshire Cat's perspective. This goes to illustrate that when we radically accept what we hear, we can become better advocates for design through storytelling. Personas, our favorite. Journey maps, storyboards, voice of business, conceptual models are just some of the tools that we can use to tell stories, make an impact, and influence change. One of our most popular forms of storytelling is a good love story. <laughs> My Aunt Carol and Uncle John first met by using the revolutionary technology 1964 of computer dating. At that time, it meant filling out a paper application, mailing it in, and the company would run it through a computer algorithm, and in about three to six weeks, you'd get a couple matches. When Uncle John got his, he immediately called up and arranged a date with Aunt Carol. It was a first date, and it must have been pretty good because they married within a year. They stayed together for 58 years before my Uncle John passed this last year. My husband Nero and I met through a dating application, Tinder, <laughs> which you can download fill out your profile, and start swiping like five to 10 minutes? I think I had it for about a day before Nero and I matched. He messaged me right away. I panicked. So I waited for about a week to respond until he posted something funny on Instagram. We got married after about 18 months of being together. Both my aunt and uncle, Nero and myself, could only have our stories because we trusted a process. They trusted the computer dating company would provide them with a potential match for a relationship, we trusted the profile we swiped right on was authentic. <laughs> they had landlines, and we had video chat in our cell phones. Looking at these stories, we see how the mediums or technology has changed, but the human story of finding love remains the same. Stories don't live in isolation, and they often rely on other hidden stories to become reality. Aunt Carol and Uncle John met in 1964, the year the Civil Rights Act was signed into law prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin. The impacts of the Civil Rights Act can be felt by many of our own stories. Today, as it created opportunities for so many people and helped to form the society that we live in. Mildred Jetter, she was a black woman, and Richard Loving, a white man, would sue Virginia for their marriage to be recognized. And in 1967, the Supreme Court ruled interracial marriage was legal. James Ogberfell was one of 14 plaintiffs to sue for their marriage certificate to be upheld across state lines. And in 2015, the Supreme Court provided a pathway for marriage equality. And it is because of loving an Ogberfell that I can have the marriage I have today. I mention these other stories to illustrate why it's important for us to do research when designing solutions. As in these lived experiences, we learn empathy and different perspectives. When we tell a story with empathy, we can move mountains and design solutions for a wider audience. As we move into our careers, we will be asked to be both professional storytellers and story listeners. When we are story listeners, we need to start by doing research. Identify the North Star or guiding principle, as this helps to create the message and the scope. Learn about what has led to this moment and acknowledge the hidden stories. As we do the research, talk with others. <laughs> Radically accept what you learn, especially when it challenges what you believe in. If it challenges you, lean into why it's challenging you and use empathy to see the different perspective, because that is where we grow. Remember, everyone is on their own adventure. There are 8 billion people alive today, meaning 8 billion different ways to live life and 8 billion different ways to tell a story. As we shift to becoming storytellers, we need to use the empathy when telling the stories. We aim to champion a diverse population with diverse out-of-the-box solutions. As we know when we design for diverse populations, everyone benefits. 
How we tell a story will change based on our audience, and that might change where we begin the story. As Gabriel Garcia Marquez illustrates at the beginning of 100 Years of Solitude, it's a great read. Um, telling a story doesn't have to start at the beginning. Many years later, as he faced a firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. Ice, ice. Here, Garcia Marquez starts the story with a reflection and helps to transport the reader into his book. Earlier, I gave an example of a love story to show how stories stay the same, but mediums we use to tell them change. The same is true for our shared story in getting our master's degree. We all had to apply, get accepted, woo, participate in classes, do the work, and show up. We all had support systems and structures, yet they all look different. So when we go into our jobs and aim to tell stories, remember your own. Champion the story you tell as you would champion your own. If you don't know how to tell a story, actively listen to another storyteller and radically accept what they tell you is the truth. If it makes you uncomfortable, learn why. If it makes you think, ask why. We have done the work, we have arrived at the end of the program, but we have also arrived at a new beginning. Take what you've learned, the skills you've honed, the friendships you've made, and go forward. As Neo from The Matrix would say, <laughs> I don't know the future, I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. Oh, sorry, I should do my Neo voice. I came to tell you how it's going to begin. <laughs> um, with that, thank you, Cohort 7, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I cannot wait to see how far we go forward, what we do with our stories, and how we champion others in a diverse range of industries and services. Before handing off to Ayush, I'd like one last, to share one last quote from J.R.R. Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Don't adventures ever end? I suppose not. Someone else always has to carry on the story. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, John. It's my pleasure to introduce now our second student speaker, Ayush Sharma. Ayush shared with me that within a week after he was accepted into the program, he got a job offer from NBC Universal. He weighed his options. Do I spend a year pursuing an advanced degree or do I accept this brand new demanding job and pu possibly push back the dream of grad school? In the end, like many of you here today, he decided to do both. It was hard. <laughs> but even with the demands of his new job, Ayush made time to be a leader, mentor, and friend to others in his cohort. Please join me in welcoming Ayush Sharma to the stage. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And thank you, John, for going first. <laughs> first, let me say a huge thank you to the family members and loved ones able to be here today to celebrate this momentous occasion. And to our esteemed faculty, and of course, my fellow graduates of Cohort 7, I'm incredibly honored to, uh, to be able to speak with you all today. As I stand here and reflect upon our journey through this program, I am truly struck by the profound transformation that each and every one of us has undergone through this program. The challenges that we faced, the sacrifices that we made, and the uncertainties we navigated have all contributed to shaping us into the resilient and capable individuals we are today. And this past year certainly has undoubtedly tested the limits of our perseverance. We found ourselves juggling our relationships, juggling time commitments, the demands of our professions, all while sacrificing our hobbies, our physical health, and our mental well-being. <laughs> it's been a year of growth, resilience, and learning to adapt in a world that demanded more from us than we ever thought possible. We questioned our abilities, we questioned our decisions, and I think for most of us, we questioned our sanities. But throughout my personal journey in this program, I came face to face several times with work that didn't necessarily resonate with me. I found myself questioning the purpose of what we as students were doing. Why, as a non-designer, as someone without an artistic bone in my body, was I engaging in sketching? 
or creating pop-up books. <laughs> and as I grappled with the purpose behind the work that we were doing, I couldn't help but wonder if I was on the right path, if what I was doing was worth it. However, these moments of uncertainty became a source of shared camaraderie among my peers and turning to one another. Together, we tried to find that deeper significance and meaning of our work. How would this help us? What value did this have in our professional lives or our personal lives? We shared stories of lessons learned, of approaches that we took, and applications to our own experiences and skills and fields. And it was through these conversations with my fellow cohort members that I unearthed one of the most valuable lessons this program has to offer. We were gifted with the chance to interact with an incredible array of individuals, all from diverse backgrounds, each with their own unique stories and experiences to share. Working alongside such creative and inspiring minds, I came to realize that the knowledge gleaned from my peers was just as valuable as the insights gained from my academic pursuits, if not even slightly more. The bonds we forged, the stories that we shared, and the lessons we learned from one another contributed to a tapestry of learning that I'm proud to say extends far beyond the boundaries of just this curriculum. I came to realize that the value that these seemingly inapplicable projects held was in their ability to bring us as peers closer together and engage in more meaningful conversations to learn from. But that's not all. In the midst of these moments of uncertainty, I came to appreciate the profound impact that they had on my personal growth. Each instance of confusion and each instance of doubt served as a catalyst for introspection, leading me to discover more about myself and my passions and the direction that I truly aspired to follow. Is it okay if I don't like some of this work? Will I be somehow thought of as lesser if I don't complete this with a smile on my face? Does it diminish my value as a person? Or does it diminish my value as a member of professional society? Now the answers to those questions is resounding, of course not, because I am more than just the work that I do. But it was difficult for me not to define myself as part of this program, not to define myself as the work that I was doing and will continue to do so. And I think that's true for a lot of us. However, in these moments of uncertainty, the initial stress of defining myself solely by my work gradually transformed into an understanding that my identity is a complex amalgamation of various different things and that we are all so much more than what it says on our resume or our job application or LinkedIn profile. When I was younger, if you were to ask me what my father did for work, I don't think I'd be able to give you an answer. He worked with computers, IT, engineering, all these terms held a very vague significance to me, but I just wasn't confident. However, what did leave a lasting impression were the stories I heard about him from his coworkers and his friends. They didn't speak about his IT skills or his engineering projects. They spoke of his inspiring leadership, his pivotal role in building teams and his unwavering dedication to his colleagues. And I just didn't understand. That didn't sound anything like my dad's job title. And unless IT stood for inspiring teams, <laughs> I was no closer to answering that question. However, as my professional and academic journey unfolded, those pieces started to fit together. And the stories I kept hearing growing up began to make a little bit more sense. Those narratives painted a picture that went beyond the technicalities of my dad's job, beyond his title. It spoke of a man who used his technical skills and his experience to inspire and uplift others. Yes, my father's job was rooted in engineering. Yes, his professional experience was in IT. Yes, he worked with computer software. But his purpose extended beyond these labels. His purpose was about working with people and inspiring them to achieve great things together. And that was what I came to discover, having had the opportunity to work with such incredible individuals and reflect on those moments of my own uncertainty, the importance of finding my purpose. 
We often hear the saying, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, first, let me tell you that the truth is you'll never work harder a day in your life. But second, while it's true that finding a job that you love to do is important, I believe what's more important is falling in love with why you do it. It's not just about finding the job itself, that what, but about finding the why, that sense of purpose that fuels our endeavors. And throughout my time in this program, I've learned that purpose is what transcends the boundaries of that little box on job applications asking for our titles. It transcends entire professions and, in, and industries and is the driving force that propels us to throw ourselves wholeheartedly into our goals and our pursuits, even in the face of that uncertainty. So as we step out in the world beyond these walls, we are equipped not only with a deepened knowledge and the ability to call ourselves masters over our skills, but with a profound understanding of the power of community and shared experiences. The connections that we've fostered, the insights we've gained from one another, and the challenges that we've collectively overcome have fortified us for the journey ahead. And today, we stand on the precipice of endless possibilities, ready to embrace the opportunities that await us, armed with the wisdom that purpose, determination, and a willingness to learn from others will propel us towards that success. So to make a long story short, let's remember that our time in this program has been about more than just academic achievements or projects or assignments. It has been a transformative journey of self-discovery and growth. And as we move forward, let us continue to cherish that mo those moments of uncertainty and let us remain open to the lessons that our peers have to offer, recognizing that these interactions have the power to shape our paths just as profoundly as our formal education does. And above all, let us embrace the notion that our purpose is not limited by the labels that society places upon us, nor is it constrained by the labels that our professions provide for us, but rather it is a force that drives us to make a lasting impact, regardless of our chosen path. Thank you, and congratulations, Gohar Seven. Thank you, Ayus, for sharing your story and your inspiring words. Uh, now is the time to recognize those we've come to honor today. Dr. Masmenian. Please present the candidates for the degree of Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design. We like to repeat things to make sure that the gravitas is real. So may I ask the candidates for the degree of the Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design to stand up. Please remain standing. And Dean Papafeu, I present you, the candidates, for the degree of Masters of Human Computer Interaction and Design. Thank you. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Regents of the University of California, I congratulate you on completing the requirements for the degree for which you have been presented. New masters, can you hear me? New masters, please step forward and be recognized. Mariam Habibi. Anthony Raponi.
Kyle Olson. Clarice Bon. Janine Kim. Ryan Chan. Lindsay Erstadt. Hazel Zhou. Nika Nixafat. Emily Nugent. Aditi Trinivas Kisara. Amadreza Kedrezade. Wenjing Li. Oh. Charlotte Chan. Bridget Bergman. Danny Newman. <laughs> Ashley No. <laughs> Sandra Barboza. Evan Cox. <laughs> Audrey Lee. Renee Jin. <laughs> Lin Win Nat Riviera. Eileen <laughs> Liu. Alexis Angeline Katipon. <laughs> Srimathi uh, Vetri, Vetri Alan. Sorry. <laughs> Ashley. Ottenreath. <laughs> Ruby Boyle. <laughs> Andrew.
Andrew Kealoa. Uh, Makasini. Gary Cristomo. Chris Astomo. Elizabeth Hobbs. Paul Jennings. <laughs> Michael Methvin. <laughs> Kingsley Abel. Michelle Vo. <laughs> Minyu Wang. Michelle Florero. Yeah. Hanjin Choi. Derek Truel. Christine Hong. Shreya Ravi. <laughs> Purnima Janji. Congratulations. <laughs> Christina Lee. John Nolan Moso. And Ayush Sharma. That concludes the presentation of degrees. You may be seated. Congratulations to you all. We are so proud. <laughs> we are so proud of what you've accomplished, but it couldn't have been done without the support of those around you. There are very special guests here today who deserve well-earned recognition. They have encouraged and in many cases made great sacrifices so that the graduates 
before us could further their education. Now students, please stand and turn to thank your parents, spouses, significant others, loved ones, grandparents, children, relatives. <laughs> Okay, you may be seated. <laughs> our thanks to all of you here today, and congratulations once again to our graduates. Colleagues and honored guests, the commencement ceremony will now conclude with the recessional march. May I request that the audience remain seated until the recessional is completed. Thank you for participating in today's ceremony, and please join us in the uh, atrium for the traditional UCI champagne toast. <laughs> 